Before we get to today's prophecy update, I just wanted to mention one thing about the numerous comments I received from our online church concerning last week's 9-11 update. Please hear me out. I truly desire to be teachable. But I've had people who care about me and are very patient with me provide additional information to me. And as such, I'm revisiting this information and the abundance of evidence surrounding the events of 9-11. I do appreciate your grace and even your prayers, and here's why. I still am having considerable difficulty with what I see as an acquittal of Islam if indeed 9-11 was perpetrated solely by our U.S. government. This last week I had numerous, some were very gracious, some were not so much, comments about my 9-11 uh, update and I just wanted to uh, clarify that I will revisit this. I do want to be teachable. I am open to it, but I need your prayer concerning it because, again, if, and if you really think about it, if the U.S. government, it was an inside job and they perpetrated the events of 9-11 and not Islam, think about the ramifications of that. Now I've had some people suggest that it was both, the U.S. government and Islam. That's even more disturbing. <laughs> Because again, think about the implications of that. Uh, with all due respect, again, this is chiefly for the benefit of our online church. Don't send me more information. I, I have a lot of information already, and I don't have enough time really to go through. I, mean, I have more information than I have time to uh, sift through it. So again, thank you for your understanding and uh, I just wanted to clear that up and make that statement. Um, one more thing before we get to our update. Doubtless you heard of what many believe to be two terrorist attacks last night on the mainland, one of which was in New York and the other in Minnesota. Now, I, w I watched, probably like some of you, the press conferences, and of course they're not going to say it's, you know, terrorism, let alone Islamic terrorism, but, and it seems that in large measure, not surprising, the media is scrubbing and even censoring any mention of Islam and the role of Islamic terrorists in these attacks, but there are numerous reports that both were perpetrated by Islamic terrorists. One credible source is reporting that in the Minnesota mall stabbing, the Muslim, which eight people were stabbed, and then the Muslim man was uh, shot and killed, but he was asking victims if they were uh, Muslim. And he was shouting Allah or Akbar as he was uh, doing this. It's also being reported that Twitter just lit up with Islamic State supporters who were rushing to celebrate the powerful explosion in New York's Chelsea district, which also happened last night as well. Now it's interesting to note that the UN uh, Assembly is this week uh, in New York. It does, I think, bear uh, watching in the days ahead. Uh, and I would also add it's probably uh, something that we would do well to pray uh, concerning. Let's get to our prophecy update. Today I want to draw to your attention seven recent developments that I believe have profound prophetic significance. The common denominator with all of them is that they point to increasing wars and rumors of wars, I'll say instead of rumors of wars, threats of wars. In Matthew 24, Jesus answering the question to his disciples about what will be the signs of the end of the age and your coming, and Jesus says there will be wars and rumors or threats of wars. 
And the thing with what's happening now, and these are recent developments, uh, is that the ultimate target is none other than Israel. And more specifically as it relates to Ezekiel 38 concerning the Russian-Iranian-led attack against Israel, and perhaps more importantly Isaiah 17 concerning Damascus, Syria, which I believe is the catalyst for the Ezekiel 38 attack against Israel. It's important to note that while these developments have been in the making for some time now, it's now, today, that they're moving at what I say and call breakneck speed, and they do so in real time. So much so that just this last week we saw an unprecedented shift of the geopolitical landscape in the Middle East. So, I'm going to go quickly, uh, but what follows, it's not in any particular order, but what follows, I would argue, are the top seven developments of profound prophetic significance that we as Christians would do well to watch in the days and weeks that lie ahead. Again, not in any particular order. The first development is the recent shift concerning Russia and Israel. On Friday, Arut Sheva published an article in which they asked, will Putin push Israel to talks with the Palestinian Authority? In it, they say, Putin spoke with Netanyahu regarding the possibility of renewing contact with the Palestinians with Russian mediation. This report was received from the Kremlin spokesperson. According to the report, the two agreed to continue to discuss the possibility of gathering a summit of leaders in Moscow, not the U.S., in Moscow, and agreed to continue to work together to overcome the challenges facing the two nations on a local level. It is worthwhile to note, listen, that lately the Russians have been working on a series of communication exercises meant to try to pressure Israel and the Palestinians into holding a meeting between Abu Mazen and Netanyahu. This meeting, if negotiated by Russia, would, and this is interesting, increase Russia's authority in the Middle East. The authority that we basically signed over to them. And not just Russia, but Iran with them. Well, the second development is the ever peculiar relationship between Russia and the United States, namely between Putin and Obama. I'm going to put a picture here on the screen. This is being dubbed the Obama-Putin death stare. Listen, I've stared at this death stare. If looks could kill, two presidents of two nations would be dead. <laughs> Obama and Putin. I mean, it is, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you almost want to put a caption. You know, Putin's going, don't even think about it. And uh, Obama's looking down, achoo! And so, you know, it's just kind of, <laughs> is that weird? It is, right? Yeah, I know they have clinical terms for that way of thinking, but anyway. It was taken at the recent G20 summit in China, what a cold, cold reception uh, between the two leaders. Uh, to me, it's, it's a textbook case, you know that saying, a picture is worth a thousand words. I think this photo says it all. And so does this Washington Post article that was published on Friday about how Putin wants revenge and respect and hacking the U.S. is his way of getting it. Quoting the Post, the recent spate of embarrassing emails and other records stolen by Russian hackers is President Vladimir Putin's splashy response to years of what he sees as U.S. efforts to weaken and shame him on the world stage and with his own people. Putin is seeking revenge and respect and trying to reassert Russia's lost superpower status at a time of waning economic clout and an upcoming Russian election. He's saying, if you think you have the chops to do this, well, 
We do too, said Fiona Hill, a national intelligence officer for Russia during the George W. Bush and Obama administrations. The third recent development is, and this is huge, it's the emboldening of Syria vis-a-vis -vis Russia. By the way, let me, before I forget, say that uh, I was just breaking news this morning that Russia walked out of the UN, uh, a UN security meeting yesterday when Samantha Power, the US ambassador to the UN, implied that Russia was not dealing uh, fairly and, honesty and honestly and above board, and Russia was so offended they just walked out. It's getting really bad. This, this is really serious. I don't know how to, uh, if, even if it's possible to overstate it. Russia has basically come in and taken over. And now the United States, for all intents and purposes, just about has to get permission from Russia before they do anything in the Middle East, particularly Syria. Well, on Tuesday, the Jerusalem Post published an analysis in which they asked this question, is an Israeli-Syrian military conflict on the horizon? I, I, I just wonder, do they know what Isaiah 17 says? Because that's exactly what Isaiah 17 says. According to the Post, the firing of two missiles, have you heard about this developing this last week? Just this last week. Uh, the fire, this is only Tuesday, it gets worse. The firing of two missiles at Israeli aircraft bears witness, listen, to the growing confidence of Assad's army. It is still too soon to determine whether the Syrian army's firing of missiles at IAF aircraft before dawn on Tuesday signifies a policy shift by the Assad regime regarding Israeli military activity in the area. This determination will better be made if similar fire is carried out the next time the IAF or IDF gunners attack in response to mortar shells or artillery fire that land in Israeli territory. And by the way, it did. However, one thing is already clear. The firing of two S-200 surface-to-air missiles in the Kunietra region was not a coincidence. The Syrian army released an official statement on the incident. This is the first known instance of Assad's army retaliating to Israeli military activity in Syrian territory since the country's civil war began some five and a half years ago. This is what I mean by this has been in the making for some time, but it's just been recently that it has accelerated with this breakneck speed and is happening now in real time. The incident, the article goes on to say, bears witness to the growing confidence of Assad's army, which is succeeding, and listen to this, for the most part because of Russian help to expand its control in Syria which is still only some 30% of the territory, and to cement the regime's place as the opposition weakens and ISIS is at the beginning of the end. You have to understand that Russia and the U.S. are at odds there in Syria. And that's why they're walking out of UN meetings because of Syria. Again, Syria is the catalyst as we've talked about prior. Now, that was Tuesday. It escalated even more on Thursday. The Times of Israel reported that Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was, keyword, threatening a downpour if the rocket fire out of Syria does not subside. This is some of what the report had to say. Israel will not tolerate any missiles or mortars being fired from either Syria or from Gaza and will respond with disproportionate force, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned Thursday, a day after projectiles were fired at Israel from across both frontiers. Interesting, the, the local, the United States domestic news, the mainstream media virtually silent, virtually silent on any of this. Netanyahu said that the country will not continue to absorb rocket fire, not from the north or from the south. 
And he said this, anyone who thinks of firing a drizzle will receive a downpour, he said during a ceremony in the Gaza border city. The report goes on to say that, <laughs> are, are we surprised? The United Nations, Russia, and others have called for Israel to show restraint and to keep tensions from spiraling out of control. Dare I say, ain't gonna happen. Ain't gonna happen. It's this statement in the last part of the article that caught my attention. Quote, Israel is currently readying itself in case of all-out war. It's coming. The fourth development. It's the increasing tensions between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Again, all of these developments, the common denominator, Ezekiel 38 and Isaiah 17. This is Ezekiel 38, more specifically, verse 13, where we're told that Sheba and Dedan, the ancient name for Saudi Arabia, will only protest this alliance of nations that attacks Israel. In other words, something's going to happen between Saudi Arabia and Iran. Well, it's happening. It's happening. Listen to this. Threat. On Wednesday, the Jerusalem Post published an interesting report about how a Saudi official is warning, I'll add threatening, Iran that if they attack, they do so at their own risk. Quoting the Post, a senior Saudi official responding to Iranian criticism of Riyadh's management of the Hajj pilgrimage, remember what happened last year? urged Iran to end what he called wrong attitudes towards Arabs and warned it against any use of force in its rivalry with the kingdom. It's happening. Verse 13, Ezekiel 38, is happening. Sort of ties into the fifth recent development, which is the increasing tensions between Israel and the U.S. I, I think you know this, but Sadly, it's getting worse seemingly by the day. It's pretty much a foregone conclusion that the United States of America has turned its back on Israel. Now I know some would argue, well didn't we just sign one of the biggest uh, financial aid packages to Israel in history? Uh, be careful. Uh, there's strings attached. There's strings attached to that money. And make no mistake about it, Netanyahu is not stupid. He understands exactly what's going on. Well, last Sunday, Israel Today had an article about how Obama is fuming after Netanyahu schooled him on real peace. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu at the weekend uploaded another YouTube video this time taking at the assertion, most often made by the Obama administration, that the presence of Jews in Judea and Samaria, the so-called West Bank, is an obstacle to peace. I am perplexed by this notion, stated Netanyahu, because no one would suggest that the two million Arabs living inside Israel are an obstacle to peace, because they aren't. Netanyahu also turned the tables on the ethnic cleansing charge, noting that the only side trying to ethnically cleanse anything is the Palestinian leadership, which demands a state free of Jews. Netanyahu very clearly had the United States in mind as he asked, Would you accept ethnic cleansing in your state? A territory without Jews? Without Hispanics? without blacks. <laughs> wow. The connection was not lost on the Obama White House. We obviously strongly disagree with the characterization that those who oppose settlement activity or view it as an obstacle to peace are somehow calling for ethnic cleansing of Jews from the West Bank, U.S. State Department spokeswoman Elizabeth Trudeau told reporters. Are you kidding me? Trudeau added that what she called Netanyahu's inappropriate and unhelpful remarks <laughs> are the current topic of probably heated discussion with the Israeli government. Again, it's going to get worse. It's going to get worse. 
The sixth recent development is the increasing Iranian threat to Israel, no thanks to the United States and the President of the United States. On Monday, Arut Sheva quoted Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman as saying that Iran is Israel's greatest threat. When Lieberman was asked what he thinks constitutes the greatest threat to Israel, he responded by stating that the greatest threat to Israel is Iran. This is Israel's greatest challenge and its greatest threat. I'm reminded of what Isaiah said, that there's a curse to those who call good evil and evil good. We have called Israel evil and we have called Iran good. And there is a woe, a curse to those who do. Again, this ties into our seventh and last development. And it's that of the ever-increasing Iranian threat, not just to Israel, but to the United States. Now, you've probably noticed this recurring word, threat, or threatened, in everything that we've looked at in these recent developments. Well, on Tuesday, Breaking Israel News reported on Iran threatening to shoot down U.S. military jets in the latest provocation. The latest provocation implying that there were previous provocations. And that's what's happening. <laughs> Have you been hearing about this? Well, here's some of what the report had to say. In the latest in a string of provocations by the Iranian military, Iran threatened to shoot down two U.S. Navy surveillance jets flying near Iranian territory in the Persian Gulf on Saturday, Fox News reported. Again, I'll, I'll mention it. How many of us can get out of our minds that image of our U.S. men on their knees before the Iranians? Some of them weeping. I mean, this is unthinkable. I, I think about the America of the past under a President Ronald Reagan. Can you imagine this? First of all, they wouldn't have done it in the first place. They wouldn't have done it in the first place. But with this president under this current administration in this present America, they know they can get away with it, and that's why they do it. The article goes on to say, the planes ignored the warning and continued in their flight path Iran did not pursue. We wanted to test the Iranian reaction, one U.S. official told Fox News. Listen to how they spin this. Listen to how the officials spin this, okay? It's one thing to tell someone to get off your lawn, but we weren't on their lawn. The U.S. military classified Iran's behavior as unprofessional. Unprofessional? Merely unprofessional? This is an act of war! This is a threat of war! Unprofessional. They, say, they, they shouldn't have done that. Bad boys. Sorry. <laughs> Iran's behavior, this is the, they classified it as unprofessional, though not unsafe. Unsafe? As according to intelligence, Iran did not have missile launchers in the area. Oh, really? Anytime you threaten to shoot someone down, it's not considered professional. The official says, <laughs> anytime someone threatens to shoot someone down, that's a war, that's an act of war. I, am I losing my mind or <laughs> is this just unbelievable? Well, here's the bottom line in closing. All of the aforementioned developments point to the fulfilling of significant prophecies in the Bible. And as I mentioned at the beginning, it is, I believe, incumbent upon each and every one of us to be watchful in the days and weeks that lie ahead. Let me lastly say, and I do this and say this every week, 
If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. Call upon him today. Romans says, all who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, and you call upon the name of the Lord, you will, not might, will be saved. Why don't you stand and we'll pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we see how fast everything is moving and how things are quickly developing on a daily basis now. It didn't used to be like that. And Lord, we're thankful to you that you told us this would happen before it started to happen this fast. You've told us what's going to happen before it happens, so when it happens, we'll believe. And you've told us that when we see these things begin to happen, begin to come to pass, that we can look up and lift up our heads knowing that our redemption draws nigh. Lord, I pray for anyone who has never called upon you that today they would call upon you and be saved so that they too can look up and lift up their heads with excitement. No more fear or trepidation about what's to come but with a hope in your soon return. In Jesus' name, amen.